on the highs and lows of uh, America's outgoing president. We're now joined by Professor John Stremelow from the Department of International Relations at Wits University. Thanks for joining us, Prof. Thank you. Um, you've worked inside this system quite a bit. So how would you measure, gauge um, President Obama's presidency? Well, as you know, I'm a great admirer of uh, the president, and I think that he had a very difficult job consolidating his presidency because of the opposition of the Republicans, who for most of his presidency control the legislative branch. There is uh, in his character a temperament which I think is ideally suited to the presidency and the starkest imaginable contrast to the person who's going to succeed him, by the way. But I think when he's criticized here um, for not doing enough for Africa, you have to remember what he was up against in the United States first. And secondly, you have to also remember that when he inherited the job, it was in the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. If he had mishandled that, Africa would have suffered along with the rest of the world and of course my own retirement funds would have gone south so it, it, it is it is a tribute I think to his temperament and his decency and his dignity and the fact that there's never been a scandal that he ranks for me the greatest president of my lifetime all right let's take you back to eight years ago uh, in Chicago where he did his acceptance speech and I remember crying I mean I saw some very powerful images people moved uh, by history in the making what do you remember of that, and what were your hopes uh, of the time that was ahead of him? Well, it was exactly my sentiment yeah. as well. I, it, it was a, an extraordinarily emotional uh, moment because when you think of the history of racism and slavery in the United States, to see him put together a coalition of young people, people, non-whites, non and win, and I don't want to lose sight of the fact he's won twice. And I thought the coalition, which is the new America, America will be a majority-minority country by uh, the middle of the century, that uh, Hillary Clinton would have put that coalition together again. But she was not the candidate that Barack Obama was. So uh, let's go back to this whole Africa story. And you said that um, you know, he had to deal with a lot of things at home. Um, could he have done more for Africa? Could he have been more of an African president, being the first African-American president in the U.S.? Well, there are a couple of things. One, Africa is 54 countries. It's a very complex region. He has talked straight to Africa. He has been uh, shaped as a man by Africa. His tribute to Nelson Mandela at the funeral here was symptomatic of that. He's made a number of initiatives for young people, Power Africa, Feed the Future, that were all very positive. The expectations were much higher than he could conceivably deliver. Africa has never been a strategic priority in the United States. I don't know what Trump's going to do about Africa, but I know that Obama wanted Africa and wants Africa to succeed. And when I was working at the Carter Center, whenever we needed support for election observation here, the U.S. State Department, his administration was always forthcoming. So the expectations may be run ahead, but I think it's a little snarky to say that he didn't do for Africa what Africa should be doing for itself. Well, let's uh, stick with international relations. Perhaps controversially, he was given a Nobel Peace Prize early on in his uh, administration. When you look back at the whole picture now, um, is that something that you think he deserved? He brought troops home, yes, but there's some who say, you know, the U.S. meddled in areas that they didn't need to meddle in. Well, as he would have said at the time and was quoted, he didn't think he deserved it. He was unproven. I think there was this relief after the George W. Bush administration and the misguided policies in Iraq and the financial crisis that a fresh breath was, a breeze was blowing through America. But you can see how the cycle comes and goes so quickly because, as I said earlier, you can't have a starker contrast to Barack Obama, his character and temperament, than the con man who's about to step into the White House. So what would you say would be the legacy of uh, Barack Obama? We hear about Obamacare, which they're going to try and undo, but what would you say would be the things that he did that um, people will look back and say, do you know what, he was a great president because of one, two, three. Well, it won't be a simple one, two, three. Uh, it will be that he's upheld the dignity of the office and in the process of saving the country from that worst financial recession, pulling the troops out of these misguided wars, and maintaining an example for kids. And I would hasten to add that he will not go down in history alone. He will go down with his partner, the exemplary Michelle Obama, his wife. 
And when you think of the scandals that have ravaged the White House and are likely, by the way, to ravage it in the future, he comes through looking as a president should, in my view, and that, for me, is good enough. Mm -hmm. I think we tend to over-exaggerate um, the role that the president can play in the American system because it's only one branch of government and there are too many checks and balances sometimes and too many vetoes. But I think he's carried himself off with great mm -hmm. dignity, and I'm very proud to say that I voted for him twice. If we look at the person who's uh, become, is becoming president on the 20th, um, one wonders uh, how is it that Barack Obama managed to get elected eight years ago and four years later, given this population group that put Trump in power? Well, that's a very interesting and complicated question and I think historians are going to be looking at for a long time. But in a nutshell, don't forget that many of the people who voted for Trump also voted for Obama. Obama was able to connect with the rank and file, both black and white, in a way that Hillary Clinton couldn't. And after all, it's been two, two terms of Democrats, Americans like to change, change parties. But she won by over three million votes. The American constitutional system is fundamentally flawed, and it's a democratic deficit. It's no example to South Africa or the rest of the world in that regard, and they can't really reform it very easily. So. Um, his coalition is a lot more powerful and potent, I think, and let's see what happens in the next two or three years. His post-presidency is going to be very active. He's going to have to sort of be the voice of the Democratic Party, and he's going to try to do some of the uh, challenges to the constitutional deficits uh, through this redistricting committee that he's going to chair. And I think it'll be very interesting to watch Barack Obama in the next four years. All right, so you, you mentioned his partner, Michelle Obama, and some might suggest that uh, she was more than just a first lady for him. She was his heart and soul, and he's the first to say it. And, at, you know, at a time when um, the personal relationships and family relationships are so frayed, and particularly across America, uh, the ironic thing is you have a black man taking the White House who exemplifies the kind of storybook relationships, and they're real, of, of uh, husband-loving wife and, and wife-loving husband and two lovely, lovely children. And the fact that they're inhibiting this white, inhabiting this White House that was built by slaves makes the mm -hmm. story all the more poignant. Uh, poignant. And, and that's why I was so disappointed to see that there was this resurgent in the Rust Belt, the disaffected with globalization, the out, let's make America great again for white men, uh, managed to squeak through and win an electoral college, but not a popular majority. So mm. uh, I think Obama's legacy will be burnished. He's as popular as he's ever been in the White House. Um, you know, no president is ever overwhelmingly po popular in the U.S. It's too divided a country. But he'll, he'll endure, I mm. think. And she certainly was very much to his credit, but he also to her credit. The significance of going back to Chicago to do his farewell speech, and what's he likely to say? Well, we can stay up until 4 o'clock this morning <laughs> and listen to what he's going to say. And I think it's going to be a review of where he's been. But I also think it's going to be a, an appeal to, as he says, the better angels of our nature. He has performed, he, we know he doesn't like Trump. We know he was opposed to Trump. And yet he has upheld the institutions. He likes to say that nothing is the end of the world until the end of the world. This is not the end of the world. Let's pick up our bootstraps and remember that the kind of things that he fought for, including inclusion, uh, are still very much uh, jobs that need to be done and the country is becoming more and more pluralistic and must be politically more pluralistic. It's not just the two coasts, it's the whole country. Mm. But it's a long slog, as you suggested. America evolves very slowly, perhaps too slowly. So has it given any indications what happens next? What will be the former president's role in the world and in America? Well, I think he had planned to go to Hawaii, relax and write his memoirs with Hillary Clinton carrying on his agenda. Now, because of the vacuum, he is staying in Washington, D.C. because his uh, youngest girl has to graduate from high school first, and so they're taking uh, a house not that far from the White House. I think that he, I know he's committed to doing this work on the congressional redistricting that has so favored the Republicans and has been a source of concern about voter equality. And I think he's going to get his, his, uh, his presidential library up to speed. But he's being a little cagey about how outspoken he's going to be. I don't expect him to say a lot initially. He's going to write his memoirs in the first year. And then we'll see. But uh, people like me are going to look to him mm -hmm. as, uh, as, as a voice to appeal to our better angels. And I suppose we'll see, maybe see a lot more of him on the continent in the future? 
He says so, and I would hope so. Uh, I'd love to see him come down here. You know, he started his political career by uh, being active in the anti-apartheid movement when he was an undergraduate at Occidental College. So uh, his roots go very deep, and, and I think we may have to welcome him back here, and I hope he'll get a nice welcome. She's denied it, but do you think Michelle Obama's got a political future? I don't. I really don't. She was reluctant uh, for her husband to get into politics, and she's been a more than a good soldier. She's been a real leader. I mean, her speech at the Democratic uh, Convention and uh, during the campaign really were the high notes. And she always says, let's go high, they'll go low. Uh, he, she, t she, again, is appealing to um, what it means to be humane, what it means to be respectful, what it means to have... Uh, empathy with the other person, particularly those less fortunate. So I think he'll be, she'll be active with, with women and girls, but also probably speak out on constitutional mm. issues because she's a lawyer. <sighs> Will world politics be poorer without him? Um, we're already seeing things shifting a little bit, China, Taiwan, Russia uh, with the U.S. Uh, without Obama, what, what's likely to happen, do you think? Well, I, 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 you, you catch me on an, an ironic mood because I think the rest of the world needs to understand the kind of challenges that we face like climate change and globalization require collective action. And I think for South Africa to focus on Africa right now and reassert its leadership as it did during the Mandela and Mbeki years for uh, Latin America to sort of pull together and be more integrated economically, those are the building blocks of a new world order. If everyone's sitting around worrying about America, uh, there's no point to it now because we don't know what Trump's going to do. But Obama can talk to those issues. He's a multilateralist. He's a cosmopolitan. He's a globalist. And he believes in the UN and he believes in climate change. So he will be an ally to those like the South African foreign policy I, I, I admired uh, during the early years of the post uh, uh, vote, first voting uh, decade um, to reassert an Africa renaissance that matters. He'd be a strong supporter of that. And uh, maybe one last kind of um, uh, international statement he made, maybe, Israel, that uh, UN vote on the settlements. What do you think was the thinking behind that? Uh, I've always said that uh, Mandela uh, described himself as having a stubborn sense of fairness. O Obama admires that stubborn sense of fairness. What he tried to do to get a peace settlement was tenacious and he also gave all sorts of arms deal sweeteners to the Israelis the Palestinians have been horrifically treated it is a kind of an apartheid system and therefore I think the abstention in the UN Security Council was the right signal to send and Trump of course is already trying to reverse that or right, perhaps finally what's uh, what's one memory will stand strong for you when you think about Barack Obama what will you remember straight away well, like you, I remember the inauguration in 08, but even more so mm -hmm. the reaffirmation of he as a good man by the election in 2012. I, I also will remember after some of the shootings in, um, in America how he brought the country together. And I think it's that, as he says, we have to appeal to our better nature. He's uh, angels of our nature. He's a, he's a diehard admirer of Lincoln, and he's going back to Chicago, which is Lincoln's hometown as well as his own. Um, he would never compare himself, but he is in the tradition of Abraham Lincoln, and for that I admire him most. Wow. No, he was quite powerful, wasn't he? I think many people remember him differently. I uh, remember the moment when he sang Amazing Grace, I think, in Oh, it was uh, stunning. Churches. Stunning. And that just put a different stunning. kind of tone on things, isn't stunning. it? Stunning. Prof, we're going to have to leave it there, but thank you very much indeed for your thoughts, your insights, and helping us um, put a little bit of sense to uh, eight years of, uh, of a presidency. Thank you so much for thank your time. Thank you. All right, and that's where we'll leave it for the time.